we say the prayer, a woman of worth, we say many girl, many women have done worthily, but you have excelled them all. Mm. This is exactly how we feel about Lynn in the well, decades at least of years that we have been together. She has been an inspiration to me definitely. She is a woman that I think all of us should look at and uh, admire, but admire to emulate. A woman who has raised a wonderful family. She has got a husband. Usually, you say that behind every man there is a worthy woman, but in this case, I think we can say just the reverse, not only the reverse, but at least it's true as well. And her children are really the grapes of the vine, each of them who is fantastic in many ways. And equally worthy. Equally worthy. And today I had the pleasure of meeting Adam, who is the last person in the family that I haven't known until now. Where is Adam? Hey. 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 Um, my son, the doctor. <laughs> my son, the doctor. Her level of knowledge and dedication to the subject that she has been studying for years is just amazing. I don't know, and I don't know if any of you knows any woman or any person who is dedicated, particularly women who has done this thorough research and um, has assimilated and accumulated so many details and so many stories and so many facts that people do not know. And the service that she is doing and has been done for the Jews from Arab lands is of no comparison. Uh, today, when you say, Lynn in London, nobody <laughs> asks which Lynn. There are many Lynns here, but uh, everybody knows mm. the quality of the woman and the quality of this book, which um, I'm sure uh, you will grab. I hope we have got enough. Um, yeah, so um, it's no wonder that the publishers were so keen to publish it. And we are so privileged to have uh, this evening as the official launch of the book. The person that is going to interview Lynn has been, or in conversation with Lynn, rather, uh, is um, the person that is sitting uh, in front of you. Um, and uh, um, Saul Tzatka, um, who has been with, uh, with us also for many years and has given us extremely wonderful and quite quaint and different um, approaches to how he teaches. I think by looking at him, you can see that he is not the run of the mill person. <laughs> and yeah, he, um, many of the events that he has organized with us, both with Harif and with Sparrow Art, have been really memorable, and many people are reminding us of them. Um, he's dramatic, he is going, he's traveling around the world to the most unusual places, uh, exploring things which nobody else has ever dared to explore. Uh, he is a journalist, he's a writer, he appears on television, and I'm sure that after this evening, you will follow his uh, name wherever he appears. Yes. I want to say one thing, that you have got these things on your chairs. I have to say that uh, we don't want to cut the trees in vain. So since I know that a lot of people do not uh, look at the website, please take it with you, put it beside you, and put all the dates, uh, because as this program will prove to you, it's worthwhile coming to our programs. Thank you. Good evening, ladies, muscle hair gentlemen. 
the topic of Arabs from the Arab lands is still very relevant. I was I was on the telephone with with Tunisia today, and I was uh, updated about a petrol bomb that has been thrown at the synagogue in Jerba, the place that has been described as the bastion of Jewish Muslim coexistence for hundreds of years. This is to do with the riots that are, st are still taking place in Tunisia nationwide. You may have heard about two petrol bombs that have been thrown at two synagogues in Shiraz, in Iran. At the same time, when I visited uh, Tunis a couple of uh, months ago, uh, during uh, the time when some people in Tunis uh, marked the 50th anniversary of Six Day War, in which on one single day, and it is, it is mentioned in Lin's book, on one single day, Houses of Jews in Tunis and the suburbs of Tunis were looted and burned by Tunisians. Some of them were people who were dealing with Jews all their life. And this is once they knew about the scale of the Israeli victory during the war. Then this looting spree, an orgy of burning, has started. But the Jews were protected by many other local residents. But it prompted a huge immigration of 18,000 Jews to Israel within the same period of time. And when I was in Tunis a couple of uh, months ago, I visited the chief rabbi who told me that the community is still um, coping with the fact that so many of the Jews left their properties behind because they were so afraid of their life. Luckily, nobody was killed. But the complexities of living properties behind, and all of them were taken over by Muslims, is something that he is grappling all the time with him. The chief rabbi of Tunisia is not really a chief rabbi, he is a state agent. In any case, this just to illustrate the fact that even in Tunis, which was regarded as a, a very tolerating country, uh, the Jews were afraid of their life at least 50 years ago, and not so many of them are uh, today living in uh, Tunis. And the petrol bomb in Jebel was just a reminder. When? When it happened? Mm -hmm. As I said, 50 years ago. They are in Jerba, it was about three weeks ago or so. Anyway, at the same time, uh, a month earlier, I visited the Jewish community of Marrakesh, and they told me that in January, which is a, a year from now, the king visited the Melah, the Jewish quarter, and when he heard that all the street names have been changed to Muslim names after the Jews left Morocco during the 50s, he ordered the reinstation of, to reinstate the, the, the Jewish names of all the streets with an immediate effect. And that's exactly what happened. If you go to Marrakesh today, you will see all the names are Jewish as it was before the mass Jewish immigration. And the topic is still relevant because of the decision taken by the American president to halve the American contribution to UNRWA, the agency that is still maintaining the Palestinian refugees in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in other countries of the uh, Middle East. It is still with us live and kicking, and one of the person, if not the person who kept it alive all the time, is really Lynn. I should not have to introduce you to Lynn because I'm sure that most people in this room are anyway members of her fun club. <laughs> fun but, club. <laughs> but because we have to go through the protocol, I would say that if a person has been single-handedly uh, waging a crusade in order to avoid the possibility that the plight of the Arab Jews would dive into oblivion, it is really lean. Of course, many other people helped her. I can see Michelle Huberman as one of them. <laughs> Not to speak about Lawrence of Judea, her husband. <laughs> but it was lean who put the plight of the Arab Jews on the map. In the book, I, she mentioned that. No, don't. <laughs> yeah. exactly I know, she doesn't like the term Arab Jews. I know that. She mentioned it in her book. I'm sure about it. And yeah. on top of everything, about 10 years ago, in 2005, which is more than 10 years ago, she established the organization called Harif. 
and I would not have thought about a sexier name than Harif, <laughs> which in Hebrew means piquant, spicy, seasoned, hot, sharp. Clever. In football, is somebody who's on the ball, and it really helped to spice up, if not to sex up, the dull community in which we live in. So wherever you go, you cannot escape the name Harif. <laughs> During the annual music Jewish festival in Regent's Park, Harif, with the help of uh, Michelle, uh, Michel. erects a Hina uh, tent. Yeah, and I'm sure some of the Ashkenazis are saying, mm, look at this. Bar barbarians. <laughs> yeah. When you go to the Israeli Film Festival in May, she is one of the main sponsors. When you read some of the media outlets, Jewish and mainstream, you cannot escape her articles. Sometimes when there is a Jewish event, an even non-Jewish event, she has a stall. Harif is almost everywhere. And people now know that Harif means spice, not only food, but also spice mentality. So I think that uh, Lynn epitomizes everything with the, name, with the name Harif. And on top of everything, as if she has time at all, she wrote a book. I should declare an interest. Uh, because for the fact that I'm lavishing so many praises and compliments on her, I should yeah. Tell you declare publicly, declare an interest that somehow, uh, although remotely, yeah. we are relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so that don't take any any positive thing that I say about about Lynn for granted. Uh. Don't take my word for it. You will have to judge her on her answers to me and on the book that I hope everybody will mm -hmm. uh, will will buy. How much is it? Yes, now? It's twenty five. So it hasn't yeah. it hasn't been reduced since we started the evening. <laughs> 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 Mind you, when two Iraqi Jews meet each other, they are bound to be relatives, this way or another. Yes, yes, Only right. recently I found out that I have relatives who were born in India. Yeah. When I visited uh, Burma... So that means I have relatives. Exactly. <laughs> when I visited Burma a couple of years ago, I found out that I have relatives in Burma, although they are buried in the Jewish cemetery of Rangoon. And only lately I found out that um, um, the first minister, the first prime minister of Singapore was also a distant relative of mine, which convinced me a couple of uh, months ago to take a DNA test, which confirmed the fact that I am a Babylonian Jew 78%. Don't ask about the other percent. <laughs> And this, and this discovery, which has been, by the way, organized by a, a, an Israeli startup company called My Heritage, um, led me also to another list of participants. They sent me a letter and said, for an extra charge, we can give you a contract. And they sent me a list of many, many lost relatives, some of them <coughs> even as far as, as Australia. But I thought it would be better if I would not contact them. Because by looking at them, the sound of their, their, their names and their picture did not suggest that they will improve my financial situation. <laughs> On the contrary. So this is it. Lynn, you wrote a book. And I'm a bit puzzled, first and foremost, by the cover. Yeah. Why did you choose Lillian Levi Cohen, can it be more Jewish than that? Levi and Cohen at the same time, mm -hmm. the famous Egyptian uh, actor, actress, yes, for your actor. cover. At the same time, you chose a picture of an Iraqi refugee, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. who doesn't look at all as somebody who uh, met Lillian, <laughs> yeah, as, if, <laughs> as if you wanted to emphasize the contract mm -hmm. between an Iraqi Jewish refugee who made his way to Israel to suffer another 13 years of oblivion with the glamorous Lillian. Why did you choose those two pictures? Uh, well, before I answer that question, first of all, thank you, Shaul, for that wonderful um, promotional <laughs> prelude, which is now a, a promo video, <laughs> or video promo. 
And Nietzsche, thank you for your very kind words. Of course, I can think of no worthier woman than you, because you've been at it for a lot longer than I have, organizing the most wonderful uh, talks and events, and basically putting Jewish culture on the map. To get to your question, um, now, <laughs> Yes, this is a very glamorous lady. Her name is Camellia. That was her stage name or screen name. She appeared in several films in, in Egypt in the early 40s. Um, and at the time, actually, there were quite a few well-known um, Jewish stars of stage and screen in Egypt. And there were directors and there were producers. Um, and all over the Arab world there were Jewish um, musicians and people who contributed to the culture of, of the Arab world. Um, why did I put the uh, Iraqi Jewish refugee on the same page? Well, really these two people represent the two sides of the coin, if you like. Um, this is Jewish civilization. She is Jewish civilization. This is what happened to Jewish civilization. Um, all the Jews were kicked out and they were sent um, packing, literally, with only a suitcase in many cases. They ended up in tent camps and you can just about see the tent here. And actually, I realized later that there was a sort of rather interesting symmetry between the pyramid that you could just about exactly. see I here. Exactly, I thought that's what, that's what yeah. you were supposed to do. And, and the tent. But it was only later that I realized there was a sort of symmetry. So, so I hope that answers your question, shall we? Okay. I just want to add the fact that uh, Lawrence just gave me uh, a very rare card which features Leila Murad. Can you tell us oh, something yeah. about uh, her? Leila Murad was actually much more famous than Camellia. Camellia, I chose her because she wasn't as famous as Leila Murad, but Leila Murad was the real star. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a singer, yes. she was an actress, she appeared in, in dozens of Egyptian films, and even today she is well known. Well, did you uh, aware of her Jewish background? Yes, she was aware. Actually, she was the daughter of a Khazan. Oh, wow. um, and Rather sadly, towards um, the end of the 1940s, I think she, she was accused of uh, spying for Israel. Um, she ended up converting to Islam. Um, she was accused of embezzling money or, or, I don't know, being paid. I think she was accused of being paid by Israel. Um, and um, she sort of finished her career in, in a sort of... Uh, under a cloud, if you like. Uh, it was very sad. Okay, I haven't finished yeah. with the cover. The <laughs> subtitle is How 3,000 Years of Jewish Civilization in the Arab World Vanish Overnight. But the Arabs did not last that much. No, you're right. So well, it should have said um, Civilization in the Middle East and North Africa, actually, to be absolutely precise. But it was too long. <laughs> so, so are, you going, put Arab are you going to remove 3,000 uh, years from the next edition of the book? No, no, I will not because there's pretty well 3,000 years of continuous Jewish um, residence in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, a thousand years before Islam, uh, a thousand years before the Arab conquest. So I think the important point is that these Jews were there for a very, very long time and they were effectively the indigenous people or one of the indigenous peoples of the region. Okay, in your crusade to tackle ignorance about the subject, you wrote a, a book which somewhat could be regarded as a bit angry because it seems to me that you uh, went out of your way in order to smash once and for all the myth of Jewish Muslim coexistence that existed in this particular part of the world. You are saying not at all. The tendency to describe the Jewish 
period in this particular uh, uh, Middle East is not exactly rosy. You are saying, yes, of course, we were all uh, overwhelmed by the scale of the German genocide against the Jews of Europe, but one has to also concentrate on the fact that the Jews did not live so well under a Muslim or Arab regime for many, many years. And in a very impressive way, you are cataloging uh, dozens and dozens of pogroms, uh, many of them uh, ended in mass killing of Jews all over the Middle East, and I'm not talking only about the Farhud in Iraq in 1941. So it seems to me that you are taking a special emphasis on saying, no, we should not be tempted, as many Jewish intellectuals used to say, no, the Jews did not have any um, good life in these Arab countries. Well, Shaul, you're being um, characteristically provocative here. Um, I didn't say uh, that it was uh, 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 just one continuous catalogue of massacres and, and pogroms. Um, I think there were good times, um, but there were also bad times. Um, I do concentrate on the 20th century when, of course, that was the big... The, the big catastrophe for the Jews in, in Arab countries, and uh, they were forced uh, into exile. Um, but I think I, I try and paint a picture of shades of grey, not just black and white. Fifty shades of grey. Fifty shades of grey, if you like. <laughs> and, and I think it's important to emphasise that there's a difference between coexistence and symbiosis. And I think the fact that the Jews lived for such a long time in the region meant that there was a symbiosis of cultures um, and the Jews actually contributed to that foundational culture. So what we refer to today as, as Arab culture is actually not Arab, originally Arab, it was Middle Eastern and North African. And let's say, you know, a lot of that was also Jewish. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that, that there is this symbiosis which you didn't have in the Christian world for the very reason that the Jews have been there for such a long time. And just to give an example, like the, the, the religious shrines in, uh, that you find in North Africa or in Iraq, I took uh, one example, the shrine of Ezekiel. Um, uh, Th that was a Jewish shrine, which then the Arabs um, decided was also a Muslim shrine. And that is something which, you know, is, is sort of unique to that region. Uh, the fact that two different sets of, uh, of, of communities can both um, worship the same prophets and, and um, visit the same shrines. At the same time, some of critics can say, while overestimating the level of hostility towards the Jewish minority in the Arab world, you underestimate the fact that many, many fr Arab friends or Muslim friends, yes, favored the Jews and protected them throughout history. You even said when um, the Ottoman Empire accepted the Jews who fled Spain and Portugal from the Inquisition, you said as hey, it was not out of uh, benevolent reasons, yes, they needed the Jews. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. I mean, would you argue with that, Shaul? Um, I mean, in the same way as Oliver Cromwell accepted the Jews um, into Britain in 1666, uh, there were some very pragmatic, uh, opportunistic reasons behind that decision as well. He needed a banking system. He needed a banking system. He needed the rich... Um, Spanish and Portuguese merchants uh, with their contacts and, um, and their wealth. Um, so, uh, as I say, it's not all black and white. Arabs still lamenting uh, the, the plight of the Jews, the fact that so many Jews left, and many of them said, definitely in Iraq, yes, the, 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 the demise of the Jewish community in former uh, Babylon, in my family, by the way, they never say Iraqis, they said always Babylonians. Uh, this brought about the near collapse of the Iraqi economy. 
The same could be heard by uh, Muslims from other uh, Arab countries who all the time said that without the Jews nothing has left. I remember myself uh, going to a Makam concert in London uh, about a year or so ago. I think Nathan, who is in the crowd, uh, explained to me what Makam music is. You mentioned it in your book. And you also mentioned an episode in which on Yom Kippur, the Iraqi radio orchestra did not perform. And when Nuri Said, who at that time was the prime minister and also very fond of classical music, switched on the radio and heard nothing. And then he was told that because of Yom Kippur, the Jews could not perform on that particular day. He, was, he got very angry and set up his own orchestra. You even mentioned the fact that after the Jews left, there was hardly any music musicians in Iraq at the same time. So there is a kind of regret <coughs> that you still sense among also Arabs who immigrated to this country, that letting the Jews live was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was definitely a big mistake, but I think this nostalgia for, uh, for the Jews and the way things were, say, in the 1920s, is quite a recent phenomenon. I think you can, you can really trace it back to, to the Arab Spring in 2011, when suddenly intellectuals in Iraq began rediscovering their Jewish community and, and uh, writing about it. And in fact, I think over 20 novels uh, have been published that feature uh, Jewish characters. Um, and the same sort of process was sort of going on in, in the other Arab countries, in Egypt. Um, films have been made about, about um, the Jews um, and uh, so I think it is, it is quite a recent phenomenon, but it shows how important uh, Jews were, not just to the economy of these countries, but they were a force for modernization. You know, they were at the forefront of westernization <coughs> and modernization. Um, uh, and perhaps that's, that's what um, they regret. Yeah, during my last visit to Marrakesh, I met a professor from the University of Fez who wrote a huge book in Arabic in which about the Israeli-Moroccan illicit military relations, especially about the fact that the Israelis helped to build a huge wall between Morocco and Western Sahara in order to block the invasion of the Polisario fighters after the Spanish left the Western Sahara in 1975. And he told me there is still a sense within the Moroccan community, the non-Moroccan community, non huge Moroccan community, that the Jews who enjoy coexistence with us betrayed us by immigrating to Israel, which was still a, a technically an enemy's country. Well, um, I, <laughs> I think this, this, um, it takes two to tango. Um, you can't blame the Jews from emigrating from Morocco, because actually they had quite a hard time. And Morocco ha had perhaps the worst record of um, pogroms, if you like, of, of any Arab country. In and the this, old days? Uh, well, 19th century, not so old. Mm -hmm. 1905, 1907, 1912, the big Fez uh, massacre. Um, and of course, 1948, when 40, 48 Jews were, were killed. Um, so I would say that the Jews of Morocco, perhaps more than any other community, um, had this sense of insecurity when they lived, uh, when they lived in the country. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the Polisario guerrillas and the war uh, with Algeria, because it's my argument in this book that what motivates the, the, the king of Morocco and the reason why uh, he's invested so much money in, um, in the Jewish quarters of Moroccan uh, towns, for instance, and changing all those names back from Muslim, Muslim names to Jewish names in, in the ghettos, is because he wants, he wants the Jews on side um, because they are very important for foreign policy. And his foreign policy is that he lays claim to Western Sahara. 
Um, and he wants the Jews on side. Why? Because he thinks the Jews in America are very powerful and have an influence on the American government. Where have you heard that before? Um, and of course, they're very important. The Jews are very important for tourism because tourists will come and visit the, the Jewish uh, quarters of, of Moroccan towns. They will visit the, the synagogues and all that. So, so it's, it's actually quite a cynical calculation, I think, behind all this business. And of course, the coexistence initiatives, um, you know, you can begin to understand why he supports them as well. I should add mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the uh, festival in Lagba Omer in Jerba yeah. has been initiated in, uh, by the Tunisian government yeah. because they wanted to have a flow of Jewish tourists from around the world coming mm -hmm. to Jerba for well, about there, a year or so. Well, there you are. You see that uh, to a lesser extent. I think Tunisia is very dependent on tourism. And of course, the Jews of Jerba are absolutely key to tourism there. Uh, and in fact, I think the Minister of Tourism was almost a Jew, wasn't it? Um, what's his name? Um, him. I don't know, but we should yeah. we should well, talk we should. about the yeah. fact we yeah. should talk about the fact that uh, if the, the the synagogue, the famous synagogue in Jerba, yeah. Al Griba, yes, is revered also by by the Muslims. Mm -hmm. So much so that uh, uh, the widow. The, the, the wife of the former so-called dictator, Ben Ali, who has been um, overthrown by the Tunisian uh, revolution seven years ago, she wanted to, to bear a, a son, and at the advice of the rabbi, the, rabbi of, uh, the former rabbi of Tunisia, she went to that particular synagogue in order to be fertile. And uh, eventually, nine months later, she managed to... Um, give birth to, to a boy who was supposed to be the successor of Bin Ali. And, and, and funny enough, she, she went to this synagogue with Sua Arafat, <laughs> the widow of Yasser Arafat, who at that time lived in Tunisia. Right, but she didn't get pregnant. No, no. Sua Arafat did not get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the funny relationship that the Jews and the Arabs have over the centuries, that there is this belief that the Jews have some sort of direct line to God and therefore you know that if you pray at a Jewish shrine or uh, if you ask a Jewish rabbi to come and say a blessing um, somehow your wish will be you will be fulfilled and at the same time there's a very negative view of the Jew um, you know, like they managed to have both images of the Jew in their brains, in the minds at the same time, you know, that Jews, um, Jews were, were somehow associated with evil. Um, so they have two, yeah. two direct lines, one to God and one to evil. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And of course it depends on, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, it was very important for mm. you to prove that hostility towards the Jews in Arab land started well before Zionism yeah. emerged. Yeah. Well, I think you can, um, you can pretty confidently say that um, anti-Semitism was not invented in 1948 when the State of Israel was, was established. Hello. <laughs> Um, Anti-Semitism in, in the Middle East and North Africa predated uh, the establishment of Israel. And in fact, Jews were struggling to escape from the Arab world well before the establishment of Israel. Uh, I mean, one of their strategies was, was to acquire foreign nationality, Western nationality, uh, get a British passport, a French passport, an Italian passport, if they could, even if they never set foot in, in Britain or France or Italy and, uh, and didn't even speak the language. Uh, but you found that, that the Jews were trying to escape from, from their second-class status, and you haven't asked me about that yet, uh, but that there was this second-class dimmy status in um, in evidence in the Arab world until the colonial era, um, and it was only under Western colonialism that the Jews were were uh, able to enjoy equal rights with the Muslims. 
And of course, this was very important. It was a sort of liberation for the Jews. Um, and, um, but, I, but I also make the point that uh, there was a limit to how much colonialism valued uh, Jewish communities in Arab countries. And certainly the colonial powers were not prepared to defend Jews when Jews were in trouble. Um, and, and of course the greatest betrayal of all was what happened during World War II when the colonial powers actively discriminated and persecuted against, uh, persecuted um, Jews, for instance, in Algeria, uh, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Libya. Um, there was a concentration camp called Jado and hundreds of Jews died there. And of course the Vichy rules were imposed on uh, on uh, Jews in North Africa. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the Jews achieved neither equality um, under dimitude, uh, which was the, the imposition of Sharia law um, um, uh, you know, in Islam, neither did they achieve that, nor did they achieve um, full security um, under the colonial era. Then before we give uh, the, the possibility to ask questions from the floor, I would like to ask you a personal question about what drove you, not to write the book, but to start um, uh, devoting your life to the subject of uh, Jews from Arab land. You had specific personal reasons, I suppose. Your family was trapped in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and I believe that your grandfather was murdered by the authorities. Can you elaborate a little bit? Um, well, well, first of all, let me say that I am not, uh, you know, I did not instigate all this. And as you say, there are many other people working, um, advocating for the rights of Jew Jewish refugees. Um, and in fact, we should mention uh, Percy Gurji. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was absolutely devoted and 100% dedicated to Jews from, uh, from Arab, Arab lands. He, was, uh, he sat on the board of deputies and uh, it was a constant refrain. Percy Gurji was was always raising the question. But he was of, Indian, no? Uh, he was of Baghdadi origin, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, what I'm trying to do is not new, and I'm definitely not the only person doing it. Um, but you ask about my personal reasons. Well, my parents did come from Iraq. They left in 1950. Uh, but uh, quite a few members of my, my family stayed on in Baghdad, including my, my four grandparents, and I had aunts and cousins. Um, and... Um, and of course, as I was growing up, I was very aware of the fact that these people were trapped because the, um, the Ba'ath regime, the Ba'athists, um, kept uh, their remaining Jews, there were about 6,000 of them, they kept them hostages, they wouldn't let them travel. And then after the Six Day War, uh, they froze their bank accounts, they sacked them from jobs, and, the, and, um, and, and instituted public hangings. There were nine Jews who were hanged on trumped up charges in uh, Liberation Square in Baghdad. And not only that, but um, Jews would disappear off the streets and never be heard of again. And perhaps 50, 50 Jews disappeared in that way. So you can imagine that my family were absolutely terrified, um, you know, uh, the ones living in Baghdad uh, lived under a reign of terror and were desperate to get out. And what happened was, because they were not allowed to leave legally, uh, about 2,000 Jews uh, decided to escape illegally uh, through the north of Iraq, through Kurdistan, and across the border into Iran, which then was friendly to Israel. And of course, Israel was quite complicit with this smuggling operation, although nothing much was said about it. Uh, but people did um, manage to escape. About 2,000 Jews managed to escape. Most of the rest of the remaining Jews. Yeah. 
Lin, you wrote extensively about the love affair between the Arabs and the Nazi ideology. A yeah. painful, a painful part of your book. Yes. Not only that you mentioned the famous meeting between Hitler and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, you also stated the fact that about 20 Iraqi leaders lived at that time in Berlin. 60. 60. Yeah. Not to speak, of course, about the fact that there was a period of time just before the Farhud broke out that uh, Iraq was led by a pro-Nazi regime, <coughs> led by Rashid Ali. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people say nowadays, um, oh, it's, you know, what, what the problem nowadays is anti-Zionism morphing into anti-Semitism. And what I would argue, looking at the history of Jews in Arab countries in the 20th century, was uh, that's nonsense. I think the rejection of Israel and the rejection of Zionism began as an anti-Semitic movement. And you can see it in the 1930s when the Muslim Brotherhood was orchestrating riots against, uh, against Jews in Cairo um, and Jews in Hebron who were the old yeshuv, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't the Zionists at all. And they were being attacked because they were Jews. And uh, what I try and argue in this, in this book is that the Mufti of Jerusalem was one of the prime movers behind this anti-Semitism. And he kind of concocted a new anti-Semitism that was, that had elements of Islam in it, Islamic prejudice against the Jews, um, but also incorporated uh, new elements which he imported from um, Nazi anti-Semitism. So this idea that the Jews were all powerful and they wanted to control the world and must be fought at all costs. This was an idea that was imported from Hitler's Germany. And uh, the Mufti managed to fuse these two traditions of anti-Semitism, if you like, into one. Um, and, I, and I would argue that it's still very much with us today. Um, and you just have to look at, uh, um, you know, the Hamas Charter. There you have um, classic elements of Nazi anti-Semitism, you know. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so it's still very much uh, part of, you know, the Islamist yeah. philosophy. As, as well as the Holocaust denial, which is widespread across the Middle yeah. East. Um, towards the end of my part, uh, I, th I find that you were a bit too nice to successive Israeli governments that over mm -hmm. the years, mm -hmm. over the years chose for political reasons to ignore the plight of uh, Jews from Arab lands simply because they did not want the international community to balance it against the fact that the issue of the Palestinian refugees hasn't been revealed. Do you accept this as one of the reasons why such a policy has been adopted until recently by many Israeli governments? Yeah, well, I, I disagree with you, Shaul. I don't think I was too nice. I think I quote um, Tommy Lapid is saying that it was one of the greatest blunders that Israel ever made to ignore the Jewish refugee issue uh, and, uh, and, not to, um, and, and not to do anything about it until recently. Um, so I, I, I disagree with you on that. Um, but I, I do think it is about time that, um, that, that this issue did, does come to the fore. It's very important as a, a counterweight to the Palestinian um, uh, refugee issue. But not just that. I, I think it's important because you have to see um, the Middle East in the context of, of, of minorities uh, who need to have full rights. Um, and, and I do make the point in this book that even if Israel had never existed, um, the other minorities, look at, look at them, look at the Copts and the, uh, uh, and the Assyrians and um, um, the, Yazidis. the Yazidis. The Yazidis are a brilliant example. You know, they have no Israel of their own and yet they were persecuted. So I'm saying that there's a fundamental dysfunction uh, in the Arab world 
um, which, which basically um, is, is at the root of, of, of this whole problem. It's, it's, it's much bigger than just the Israel-Palestine conflict, although the Israel-Palestine conflict, or the Israel-Arab conflict, is a symptom of this dysfunction, um, of this, this inability to accept anyone who is different. And by that I mean not just non-Muslims, but any, any Muslim who's different from, uh, you know, any, the Shia Muslims, for instance, are not accepted by, by the Sunni Muslims. Um, and, you know, and so we need to solve this problem. When you do the math between the Jewish Arab refugees and the Palestinian refugees, what are the numbers in terms of uh, people and property? Well, the numbers who, um, who came to Israel, the numbers of Jews who came to Israel from the Arab world, are pretty well roughly the same as the, as the Arabs who left Israel in, in 1948. So there was, you could talk about an exchange of populations. But you're excluding those uh, refugees who went elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. If you if you include the two hundred thousand Jews who went elsewhere to Europe, Australia, the Americas, um, then there are more Jews um, who were made refugees than Arabs. You ask about property. Um, it, no one really knows the true figures, uh, but it is estimated that the Jews lost fifty percent more. Uh, than uh, the Arabs who were um, who left Palestine, who left Israel. No, I thought the figures are, are much more staggering than that because the Jews were city dwellers, while most of the Palestinians were villagers. Yeah, you could um, argue. If you feel like asking Lynn a question, yes, please. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Dennis Barney. Um, a, a refugee of which country are you? Uh, son of an Egyptian <laughs> refugee. Okay. <laughs> Um, but in view of President Abbas's recent revisionist plan, um, why do you think the, the news outlets are picking up on it? Uh, well, I, my personal opinion is they cover for him because for so long they've been peddling the Palestinian line, you know. So obviously sooner or later you have to omit or deny or lie about the facts. You know, you just have to ignore the bits that are too embarrassing to report. And I think that that's what's happened, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's worth yeah. mentioning that Abbas wrote a PhD in which he denied the Holocaust. Mm. And then, of course, he apologized for that, but he wrote it for the University of Moscow during the Soviet Union. Uh, any more questions? Yes, please. Just to, uh, a small point. Yeah. The second thing is, I'm not to phrase that, it was bad that the Jews had to leave Morocco or any other country, but Israel benefited by the fact that nearly 150,000 Jews from Morocco went to Israel, which helped the country to, to be built up. And the third point I, I want to make is, Lynn, I don't know what it's mentioned in your book, but I, I was trying to read it, I couldn't find it. Yeah. The way that specifically the Moroccans, but let's say the North Africans, were badly treated when they went to Israel. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the Arabs not treating the uh, Jews properly, the Israelis perhaps um, behaved in the same way. Right. Well, to take your last point first, yeah. I think there's a difference between discrimination, social discrimination or prejudice, and state-sanctioned persecution. I mean, you had the difference between Israel and the Arab states is the Arab states actually passed laws that were discriminatory against, against Jews, against their Jewish um, populations. So they stripped them of their nationality, they dispossessed them of their property, they forced them into partnerships uh, with, with Arabs in business, uh, they blocked their bank accounts, uh, they sacked them from public jobs, etc., etc. Now, Israel took in these, these uh, refugees. Of course, it was, it was very, very hard 
Uh, they were put in tent camps. The conditions were atrocious. There was not enough food. Um, and the, the refugees themselves thought, what on earth have we done? We, you know, we've come to somewhere we thought was paradise and they're sticking us in the middle of the desert in a tent camp. Um, and uh, it's terrible. So I would say that, you know, all this is true. Uh, and, and there was a great deal of hardship. Um, at the very beginning. It wasn't just the Moroccans who suffered, it was all the refugees who arrived, uh, and the Holocaust survivors, and the Jews from Romania and Poland who were put in, in these tent camps. I don't think there was a policy to, to discriminate specifically against uh, Jews from Arab countries. Of course, they, they felt it more because they had big families and, and the flats were not designed for big families. There were no jobs. Um, and this sort of thing. But I, I, would, I would argue that it was a, a situation specific to the 1950s, but, uh, particularly the, uh, and, and, and the 1960s, but it was quite a temporary phase when you consider how well people have done now. And, and uh, you know, we've got Moroccan friends who live in Shlomi, they have a lovely house, the husband's got a good job, and you won't hear them you know, complaining of discrimination now. Not today. No, not today. Yes, please. Um, study with Lynn on Hebrew together. Jeffrey uh, <laughs> Lynn, Lynn um, while you couldn't possibly write a book exactly the same as yours, but I've been toying with the idea of how 3,000 years of Jewish civilization in the European world has vanished overnight. Well, it hasn't quite. But the question I ask is, are we dealing really with anti-Semitism more than anything else, rather than Muslim anti-Semitism? When there's Christian anti-Semitism and probably other forms of anti-Semitism <coughs> somewhere else. So or your, the, your book, obviously, and it's a subject, is on Muslim, Jews in the Muslim world. But aren't we really talking about, as I think uh, Shaul suggested perhaps at the beginning, I may be wrong here, about anti-Semitism full stop. Well, first of all, the Jews were not in Europe for 3,000 years. They no, were, true. Yeah, that's right. I think they go back 2,000 2, 2, years. 000. That's right. Lots of uh, thousands of Jews. Uh, and they came after Christianity was established. So it's slightly different. Um, also, I would, I would say you can't really talk about anti-Semitism full stop. I think Muslim anti-Semitism... Um, is, is quite different from Christian anti-Semitism. I mean, the, the Muslims never accused the Jews of being Christ killers. There's no theological anti-Semitism in Islam. In fact, the Jews, the Jews for a very long time were considered not very important. They'd been defeated by Muhammad, um, you know, and, and the, this was a rather pitiful remnant who refused to convert to Islam. But we'll, we'll let them... We'll let them, you know, we'll tolerate them, leave them be, you know, as long as they know their place, you know, we'll, 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 we'll leave them alone. So that was the attitude, um, you know, up until the 20th century and the, uh, the advent of sort of Hitlerian antisemitism, if you like. So I would say Christian antisemitism was quite different. I don't, would you agree with that, Shelley? Yes, I do. <laughs> Okay, Eti Gatham, uh, my family from Libya, uh, and it's actually more of a, a comment than a question coming back to Shaul saying that you were too kind to success yeah. successive governments and why they weren't talking about the Jewish refugees from our, our Arab lands. Actually, many years ago, I actually read an article and we had quite a lot of discussions about mm why that was, yeah. and especially about not knowing about the Holocaust affecting Jews of North Africa, but relating to us, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, Jado, my late grandfather actually escaped from there, yeah. um, my father, my late father's uncle actually, thanks to his chutzpah, convincing the um, the Nazis there that why should you send me, you know, to Bergen Belsen when I can cook for you? Yeah, uh, brilliant. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's what saved him. And that's him. what saved him. And mm -hmm. 
eventually, um, well, he actually passed away a couple of years ago, but he was one of those that went to schools and, and talked about that. But what they were saying was that Ben Gurion didn't want all these facts known mm -hmm. because the Jews of North Africa didn't go like lamb to the slaughter. You know, because a lot of them escaped, a lot of them killed mm. some of their captures. Mm. You try and tell them that actually, you know, the European Jews were actually starved, so a lot of them couldn't fight. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so they, you mm. know, so they didn't just walk mm. like lambs to the slaughter. But that, that was, you know, that Bengaluru didn't want it known. So for mm. many, many years, nobody knew about it. And when I first saw the, the film from Benghazi to bergen Belsen, and, and I asked my parents when I went to visit, and I said, why didn't we know about mm, it? Why mm, didn't you say? Mm. Because we didn't think you would, know, you would want to know about that. Mm -hmm. yes. So they themselves were silent about the Holocaust. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact that the government didn't want it known, mm. yeah. you know, it's... Yeah, well, was yeah, fun, but, but I, I don't know how deliberate all this was. I mean, we were talking today about um, a, a lady who's um, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor from Romania, mm. and she was complaining that uh, uh, for a long time the the plight of the Romanian Jews during World War II was not was not well known. Mm. So you know, and, and these were European Jews. So mm. I I don't know if you can generalize. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, Nathan, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to move to another subject altogether. The question of uh, things that we read a lot these days, see in films, see on Facebook, this nostalgia to the home country. Hanin. Exactly. This yearning. How do you feel about that? Yeah. You, you but you mean the Arab, the Arabs, Sorry? the Arabs' uh, the uh, nostalgia to the, yeah. to the Arab culture, to the Arab uh -huh. history, Jew Jewish, the... Jewish nostalgia. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. in my chapter, because there is very little that. in the book about that. I well, a, a bit about it when you were talking about uh, Samuel Moray, but. Uh, and that yeah. No. Well, well, I start off with an example, which is um, uh, a French um, film star called Roger Hanin, who was or Hanin, who Hanin. was Hanin, Roger Hanin. He was. Um, he died uh, uh, just a couple of years ago now, and his last wish was to be buried in Algeria which was actually a crazy idea because, you know, there are no Jews left in Algeria. Mm. And, uh, you know, um, in the end, they did bury him in Algeria. There was a big ceremony and the, uh, uh, the, the Algerian government was represented and the French government and, and everything went well. But, you know, it's a very curious phenomenon. Somebody who hasn't lived in Algeria for 50 years wanting to be buried there and that is an example of jewish nostalgia and actually it's quite a strong feeling you know you do you do meet jews all the time who say oh you know it was so wonderful uh, i had a lovely house and servants and the food tasted better uh, and this sort of thing you know and and often the same person might tell you you know well actually you know i escaped through Kurdistan, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, escaped yeah. Iraq, and it was a terrible experience. Yeah, how do you, you know? feel about it? What do you think? Do you well, think this well, is I... a bit of uh, intellectual dishonesty or something? No, or I don't. I think you have to ask a psychologist, actually, because I, I think you people, people, me? people... <laughs> I didn't ask... <laughs> no, 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 I didn't have time. I'm sorry. <laughs> but maybe... Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, well, do you, I was yeah. interested in, in the comment you had with regarding Samuel Moray. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, Shmuel Moray said... Poems, he, poems, he, yeah. poems about the subject. Yeah. And then he said, you say on the yeah. that he said, who would want to go there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, he said it's like it's. That's right. It's like it's like being married to to this woman, and and uh, uh, what was it? You divorce her, and you marry someone else, and who would want to go back to the first woman? That's that's what he says. Well, well he's a bit wrong on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just yes, please. Yeah, yes. Actually, it's with Libya because my late husband was from Libya. I left. I lived there for three years. And I lived through the Six Day War. What, what is and your What is your name, please? Evelyn. 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 And I met Lynn when she set up Harif. I haven't read the book yet, but I believe that one of your hopes and aims was somewhere along the line to, and I think you do, try and not only keep the story of Jews from other countries alive, but also to see if somewhere along the line there will be some form of compensation. 50 yeah. years on. Right. Well, I, I, I can't imagine who will pay this compensation. No, I just no, wonder no. if there's any sort of thing you can say about it. Well, well um, I think the idea of compensation is actually quite remote um, because the Arab countries haven't even begun to recognise their responsibility for driving out their Jews. So how can we possibly hope that they would uh, contemplate compensating them? You, you um, so yeah. It's more complicated. You even, you even, yeah. Sorry, you mentioned the fact that some of the uh, foreign embassies in Cairo and consulate in Alexandria are located in former Jewish homes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when, when you look at, at these amazing homes, you know, you think, my goodness, this was like mass confiscation. You know, this, this is mega. Uh, and yet nobody knows about it, you know. And the, you hear all about the occupied territories and, and, you know, like a few homes being built here and there. And isn't it terrible? You know, and yet whole swathes of Cairo and, and, and Benghazi and Tripoli and Rabat or something might have belonged to Jews. You know. uh, somewhere yeah. at the back, please, in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Can you introduce Lawrence. yourself? You yeah. are you one of uh, Nitsa's yeah, well, yeah. one of Nitsa's former students, right? Not former. Ah, still current. I see. Yeah. Okay. Guilty, guilty. Mm -hmm. guilty. Thank you. I enjoyed. I enjoyed the discussion so far. Just to follow what Emil said about the paradox. I've got two sets of paradoxical terms that you can find. I just would like to know your, your comments on it. The one is. Which is true, both are true, that's what a paradox is, is that the Jews have been in the Middle East for 2,000 years and therefore are very indigenous, and yet they were the first to accept the article of European citizenship. So yeah. the indigenous aspect clashes with, with the other. Um, the second set would be the idea of Zionist and refugee, and I know this is a bone of contention in Israel until now, because to what extent I've read a book by Chapel Nisim about. Yeah, that's absolutely the thinking behind, I don't know if it was Ben Gurion or, or what, that uh, they wanted the Jews to consider themselves as returning to their ancestral homeland. So therefore they should put the past behind them and what happened there, um, you know, sh they shouldn't dwell on it anymore and they should concentrate on building the state and building their new lives in Israel. So that was exactly the thinking and that's why why Israel for so long ignored the issue of the refugees. Mm -hmm. um, your point about indigenous um, culture, you know, it doesn't mean that you can be, uh, that that culture doesn't evolve. Um, and and uh, the reason why the Jews were attracted by colonialism and they wanted foreign passports was because they lived in a state of uh, precarious mm -hmm insecurity they lived in in a state of insecurity in other words you know the ruler could change 
things could really deteriorate and there could be a pogrom and then they would be left with, you know, with no, no rights at all. They had no redress. And that's why they were attracted by, uh, by the West and by colonialism. Right. Um, um, Lynn, do you have... Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, please, at the back. Hi, um, Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Esther Livingstone. Yes, right. please. I don't know if it's a comment or a question. I read a few years ago, it might have been from your organization, that um, it was talking about this, the amount of money that you know, may be owed. And even if um, they don't get that, what's the word, um, compensation, is it not worthwhile, like, and again, with your organization, so that we have that on paper, so many Jews left, so much is owed, because to balance out the Palestinians yeah. who are yeah. saying, well, we're owed this and this, and I think that's what this organization, when I read the article, has said, mm. oh, you're talking about what you think Israel owes you? Well, this is what the... Uh, yeah, state yeah, yeah, you're is. absolutely right, yeah. It, it's just, it's very difficult to actually estimate... Uh, the losses, you know, because a lot of Jews left without without deeds. They, they have no proof of what they lost, um, and also there's this whole business of you know how do you how do you calculate it? No, but I'm saying even but, if just on paper there's some evidence that yeah. so many thousands. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lynn, while you were writing your book, uh, your son Gideon and Lawrence, your husband, were collecting material. And can you show? Can you tell us what is that? It looks yeah. like an Iraqi passport. Yeah, uh, this is actually a laissez passer, which was issued to Iraqi Jews in 1950. Um, there was a year when when Iraqi Jews could leave legally, uh, but the price they had to pay was to be stripped of their nationality. So they didn't have passports; they had laissez passer, mm -hmm. right? And stripped so, of their property as well, no? Uh, that came after the year was up. Then oh, the okay. Iraqi government passed a law um, confiscating their property. And why is it written in French and not in English? Because I think English? that's the sort of diplomatic language and you know, the language, international language. Okay. But, but what's interesting is, is this stamp here on the laissez passer, which I have on, on the back of my book as well. And that says, no return allowed. Bodun, uh, yeah, Bodun Bodun, or he, he can read it. Okay. <laughs> What's it say? Okay. Yeah, it said no return, yes. It says no okay. return. In other words, it's a one-way laissez-passer. You're not allowed uh, back inside the country. Yeah, it's, it's a one-way passport. And what is that? Ah, uh, this is part of my, my dear husband's collection. It's a postcard showing the destruction uh, after the pogrom of Fez in 1912. Um, and you can see, I mean, like, sort of... Well, I don't know if you can see that, but... Yeah. It shows... It shows... Can I pass whole, it around? Whole, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can, can you pass it around? It shows, uh, you know, buildings being destroyed, you know. Um, uh, Michel. Uh, two points I wanted to make. Um, Number one was, from what I read, that the uh, property difference was at least ten times. You know, the Jews were the business people, and they were the property owners, and whereas the Arabs, Palestinians, um, they were like tenant farmers, yeah. um, and the ones yeah. who had the property stayed. They weren't mm -hmm. quick to flee, um, and actually they say at least ten times more on the property side. Right. Well, well, yeah. I mean, there are loads of different estimates. Nobody really knows. I mean, it could be ten times. It could be it twice. Just, as you just say, uh, no, no, yeah. definitely. Me that's about far from the big yeah. house they left yeah. behind. Well, yeah. you you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but those who went to 1950, they were quite poor. Yeah. They don't compare to those who <laughs> stayed. Yeah. That 6,000 or so who mm. stayed probably owned 10 times more than the, mm. the 100 or 1,000 who the, left. Actually, you, you've, you've raised a very important point indirectly, which is that those Jews who did not settle in Israel are also entitled to compensation. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, it's unfair to make 
a comparison between the Palestinians and the Jews for that reason. Like th those who, yeah. So, so, so the current. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the latest thinking, the latest thinking I mention in the book is is that there should be an international fund. Uh, which would compensate individual refugees wherever they happen to be, right? Which sounds like a fairer way of going about it. Instead of saying, well, let's kind of cancel out uh, the losses, you know, like let everybody get something. Yeah, you mentioned the fact that in yeah. 1937, about a third of the, of the residents of Baghdad were Jews, more than Warsaw and New York at the time. Mm, mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was in the forward. So, and if they live yeah. in Baghdad, they probably own Baghdad, yes. And the second point I wanted to make, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, especially when Ralph was saying about the period in the 50s yeah. when the Jews from Arab countries were treated badly, or they felt they were treated badly in these mm. Mabarak camps, is a lot of people told me that, you know, it was terrible, but when they saw the Holocaust survivors arrive, and come and join them. They felt they couldn't complain because mm. although they'd been moaning and it was awful and they'd left their houses and everything, mm. when they saw the survivors from the Holocaust, they couldn't say anything. Mm. And I've mm. heard that so many times from people in Israel. Mm. Um, well, that goes back to your point, which is a lot of, uh, a lot of Jews did not actually talk about the, uh, you know, what it was like, what, what they'd escaped from. You know, and this sort of mm. silence also explains why nothing was said. Yeah. My, my late yeah. father, my well, late grandfather, yeah. escaping from Jandor. Yeah. I really would have liked to have known more That's right. about it. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and they weren't prepared to talk at that yeah. at that point. No, they just yeah. Yes, please. When I worked the same, my father came from Iraq, and his parents, sorry, my father did not come from Iraq, his father mentioned that, and his parents came from Iraq, <laughs> right. and around 1900, and yeah. I've been on the next commissions, and one person complained in the next commission up until they could produce you, what a bad time she had when she came to Israel. So I think the rental Jews were treated badly because of prejudice, isn't that not so? Well, I think we've we've been through this question. No, they haven't been through it. You tried to say they weren't treated badly, but the rental Jews were treat, weren't treated as well as like Nazi Jews. Well, um, I think the um, most refugees arriving in the 1950s happened to be from Arab countries. But there, was, there were um, also waves of Romanian and Polish Jews who arrived at the same time. And, and they were all, no, they were all put in the same camps. And they were all subject to the same conditions. But she doesn't agree. She said she was treated very badly by Israel. The people who came yeah. at that time were all treated the same way. And when yeah. came the Ashkenazi Jews, the Germans or Russians were treated and yeah. still, still, I, I think the Barbie Jews are discriminated against the Swedish for the Russian Jews for some reason. Anyway, what happened to your family? Did your family get, well, did your family Well, get we out? came to England. Did your family come to England? Yeah. Even though she stayed behind? Uh, no, the ones who stayed behind stayed behind. What happened to them? Well, they eventually managed to get out of, uh, of Iraq. Some Where of them so? were smuggled through the north of the country in 1970. Um, uh, others managed to get out with passports. Most important, I think you should give a talk to non-Jewish people, especially, say, amongst the Gentiles. Thank you. Yeah. We're approaching the end of the evening. A few more yeah. people want to ask questions. Uh, Lynn, I just want to ask you something slightly personal. How come, where is your mother? Is she playing bridge or is she here? <laughs> She's playing bridge, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, and, and how come she gave you the name Lynn and not an Iraqi, good Iraqi uh, Jewish name? Yeah, well, that's a very yeah? good question. I don't know, we all had English names. Uh, okay. It's funny, but she's got a, she's, she's not got an Iraqi name. Uh, what's her name? Bertha. Bertha, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's so non-Iraqi, please, yes. <laughs> yes. That's all right, yes. Hi, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say this, this idea of, of refugees. My grandfather was a refugee from the pogroms in Europe, and he came to South Africa uh, just before the First World War, and he was put in a concentration camp as a Jew um, because he was a refugee, because he spoke German, and nobody knew who he was, and there was a war going on, and so on and so forth. Mm. So I think this idea of refugees being treated badly is a way of countries actually working out who are they, where do they come from, are they genuine, are they really Jews, are they Arabs, let's work through it. 
and, and see how we can deal with it. And Israel, 1950, had no money. It had very little real infrastructure for social services and so on and so forth. Mm. And I think they did a jolly good job in this way in the refugees. Mm. Um, coming to um, Iraq um, and the Jews who were sent out of, of Iraq, um, I've been watching some videos recently about um, of narrations given by the spiritual <coughs> leaders of the Shia Muslims from Karbala, which is the Iraqi Islamic section. And um, one of the narrations that he gives is about how how Islam created Israel. Mm -hmm. um, in that when the Jews had to leave, they had to go to Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore they sent all these, he speaks about 50,000, I don't know how many actually were sent, but he speaks about 50,000 Jews were actually sent into Israel and created the problem for the world and took Palestine away from the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So this is just a different way of looking at it. Yeah, well, they're always kind of making things up. <laughs> yeah. Interesting yeah. comment. Any, anybody behind? Uh, Let's talk, yes, uh, Robin. 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 Yeah. Um, just picking up on some of the points that were made earlier um, about the equivalence of, uh, you know, moving displaced populations and, you know, the net worth of their uh, properties. Um, the 100th anniversary of the uh, 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 Balfour Declaration, mm. uh, this is lots of uh, interviews on the news. Uh, every single one of the interviews that, uh, interviews that I heard uh, selectively quoted and therefore misquoted this very, very short uh, statement, mm. particularly the last question, uh, the last sentence, uh, which says, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious mm. rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Mm. They always, every single one of them left out the rest of that sentence, mm. or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Yeah, mm. exactly. Now, I was very disappointed that even the Israeli Prime Minister, when he was interviewed on the mm. BBC, didn't, didn't think up on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when asked about uh, you, know, what, what, you know, the effect of the creation of the state of Israel yeah. on, on Palestinian Arabs. Um, notwithstanding the fact that this has now been brought up in the UN, and in and in Israel, what can be done to spread the message of your book? Buy it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um, you know I think we we we. Tell people about Jewish Book Week. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we we have an uphill struggle in that uh, a lot of a lot of Ashkenazi Jews don't know the story, you know, and so to have to educate them is is a sort of priority, and after that they you know everybody should disseminate um, the message, you know I, I hope that we will get it into the mainstream eventually, you know we need to M maybe um, now that Abbas has made such a big <laughs> mess of his, uh, mm. you know, with, with his latest speech. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe the world is willing to he hear a different message. Um, uh, Lynn, yeah. uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, celebrities, yes? Uh, we all agree, I'm sure, that uh, the Maimonides was above any, anybody else in... Uh, this Jewish uh, Arab culture, head and shoulder above uh, the rest, being the most important scholar in uh, 3,000 years of uh, Jewish learning. But you mentioned a few personalities that many people, I'm sure, in this room are not so much aware of. One of them was Heskel Sasson. Can you say a few words about him? Yeah. Well, Heskel Sasson was... Um was a uh, finance minister in Iraq uh, several times, I think it was five times during the 1920s. Um, and uh, he was responsible for tying, um, what was it, Lawrence? <laughs> for tying the oil revenues to the gold standard. That's right. Which, which meant that obviously Iraq got a lot more revenue than it would have done otherwise. Um, because it was expressed in, in gold. So, I mean, he, he was the financial genius, 
behind this. And even today, um, you know, Arabs in, in Iraq look back at Sasson Haskell, they revere him as, as one of the best finance ministers that Iraq has ever had. And they compare him to the uh, mediocre types that they're, they're stuck with nowadays. <laughs> um, so, yes, Sasson Haskell was, was a very uh, important man. He wasn't the only Jewish finance minister. There was one in Egypt as well. Yeah. Haskell Sasson also was the first one to write, to write a novel in the Arab world. Am I wrong about that? I've not heard of it. Okay. Yeah. What about Vic yeah. Victor Peretz? Victor uh, yeah, Perez. yeah. V Victor Young Perez was a boxer. He was a, um, a, world a world champion boxer. He was born in Tunisia, but he moved to France just before the war, which was actually, uh, which sealed his fate because he was uh, deported to Auschwitz. Uh, he did survive... Um, uh, he did survive until 19, 1944, was it 1944? The death march from Auschwitz, but he died on the march. Um, yeah. Albert Mamie? Albert Mamie, he's still alive, he's, he's in his 90s. Actually, we tried to bring him over to London once, uh, but he, he'd just been recovering from an operation and uh, he had to cancel his trip. But he is... Uh, he was born in Tunisia. Um, he ha actually has described his own childhood growing up in the ghetto in Tunis. Um, and I quote him quite a lot in my book because he's, he just, you know, he just has some incredible insights into what it was like to grow up as a poor Jewish boy. Uh, in the ghetto, you know, so he has none of that nostalgia that we were talking about. Um, and um, no, he's, he's a great man. He, he did write a lot about decolonization, um, you know, and, um, you know, the fact that we give a free pass to, to new countries, you know, we kind of gloss over all their misdeeds and their crimes because they happen to be third world you know, newly independent countries. Um, you know. It's worth mentioning that the daughter of Andrea Zulai, the Moroccan king's advisor and business partner, has been recently chosen to be the head of UNESCO. That's right. And then Israel left the organization. <laughs> yeah, and so did America. Yeah, yeah, that's well, right. Well, we are almost uh, coming to the end of this evening, and... Uh, I don't know exactly how to um, uh, describe uh, Lynn after such an effort uh, this evening. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Nitsa would have said, what an illuminating talk. <laughs> what can I say about Lynn, uh, Julius, the, the, the woman in black, a myth, a myth buster, uh, the ultimate juggler, Anglo-Babylonian lioness. <laughs> Writer, <laughs> blogger, mother, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Julius! <laughs>